Let's pray. Father God, finances are a tough, tough place for us. There's a lot of confusion, a lot of concern. So Lord, we, we just ask for you to open our eyes to what you have for us in this area. Help us to see what we need to see to be successful in this area. You're the God of really everything, including finances. So we thank you for being here tonight, opening our eyes and our ears and our hearts for what you have for us in Jesus' name. Welcome, Kingdom Finance. Hey, Ron, before we get started, why yeah. don't you give them a little information about your background? Oh, you want me to? Or? Yes, yeah. Okay, uh, my background, uh, you can hear me okay in the back? Okay. Um, I have a long career, but let me just summarize it very quickly. Um, my major responsibility has been to manage the portfolio for Northwestern Mutual Insurance Company. So I was the chief investment officer for that company, as well as Prudential earlier in my career, and Genworth Finance. So. My responsibility was to manage a $250 billion portfolio. So I have a lot of experience in this area. Um, but what we're gonna talk about today, from a biblical perspective, while it was important in how I manage money for a large company, it's even more important for us in how we look at our own personal finances. A Couple of statistics first. At retirement, 90% of people end up with less than $5,000 in their pockets, even after having earned over a million dollars over their entire life. Less than 18% of Christians actually tithe. The average giving at church is 23 to 3.8% of annual income. And nine out of 10 families live paycheck to paycheck. What's going on? Why are we struggling so much as a church body with finance? I wanna unlock some of that today. And what I'm gonna talk about are 20 kingdom principles. If you got the handout, it's not all gonna be covered today. We're doing this over three sessions, but I basically wanted one handout. The first two sessions will cover most of the principles, maybe a little bit left over in the third session. The last session will be really very specific oriented financial strategies that we're gonna talk about. I hope to be able to answer your questions afterwards, so think about what you may wanna ask, particularly in the third session, but it can be today or next week as well, because I wanna make sure we get to what people are really concerned about. But for today, we're gonna to start out with these principles. Couple of things. Did you know there were over 2,000 scriptures that talk about finance? That compares to less than 100 talking about salvation. Now, I don't want to suggest that salvation is less important than finance, but I do want to suggest that our money is an important topic for us to consider and for our Lord. So we want to keep that in mind. Biblical provisions. Many people believe that there is no provision for us. I do want to chop down this myth right away. So a lot of people think poverty is godly. They believe it destroys humility, uh, that it can take us away from God. And a lot, these are lies, but they have an element of truth to them. Satan is the father of lies, and this is how he works. The fact is that financial prosperity can draw you away from God when it is the world's system of prosperity. So when we start saying things like, you know, I want lots of money, I, I want a nice car, I want a boat, I want a bigger house, you know, why not try this uh, praying for these kinds of things? I'll just give it a try and see what happens. And this is where prosperity teachers can go wrong because it really has to be about the motivation and what's in your heart. It parallels good works in a sense. Do we do good works to be saved or we do good works because we've been saved? Do we want wealth to meet our wants or is it for our needs? Is it to advance the kingdom? What is the motivation behind your desire to have wealth? 
Sometimes in a lot of this, when we talk today, think about the parent-child test. It's really helpful in finance. A lot of you here are parents, so think about it. You want your children to prosper, and God wants us to prosper, but do you want your children to have money if they have no ability to steward it? Do you want your children to have money if they're gonna take it and they're gonna buy, buy drugs or something horrible for them? No. So think about the relationship that you have with your kids as we go through these things because it will help you understand why you may not be receiving some of the promises and gifts that, that God has for us. I also wanna talk about, again, how the laws of prosperity are different from what a lot of people think. So for example, everybody knows 1 Timothy 6.10, it's not money that is the root of all evil, it's the love of money that's the root of all evil. Why is that? Because the principle there is we're putting it ahead of God. So whatever it is that we put ahead of God is a problem. So it could be money or the things money can buy and that becomes an idol for us. So the principle is what are you putting first, God or mammon? And that principle goes beyond mon money, it really applies to everything. Now, God created all of the wealth, we're going to talk about this, in the earth. Did he create it for those who don't know the Lord or who disobey him? Does he intend, does he want people who are in disobedience to prosper while his children are in need? That doesn't make any sense, right? The intent is for you to have it, but there may be some things that are blocking it. Now, God himself is prosperous, and we can say that all wealth belongs to him and we're going to partake in his divine nature. In fact, 2 Peter chapter 1, this is one I don't have up here, says we've been given exceedingly great and precious promises that through these you may be partakers of the divine nature. So God, did he not give everything to us? Think about it. Jesus was the, the, the most unbelievable price that God paid that he paid for us. He really did give it all for us. So look at Romans 8.32. He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up from us all. How shall he not with him also give freely, also freely give us all things? And there are many men in scripture who followed God's laws of prosperity, actually, and were quite wealthy. My favorite example is Abraham. So it says in Genesis 13 that he had, was rich in livestock, silver, and gold. Somebody did an analysis. His wealth was quite impressive. And it applies to us, too, because in Galatians 3.29, it says, if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. So we're Abraham's heirs if we follow the same rules and precepts that Abraham did. So you should assume that you are meant for abundance unless you're doing something to block it. So if you think about it, if your great aunt dies and has a will and leaves you a certain amount of money, there may be in that constructed will certain conditions for you to get the money. And if you fail to live up those con to those conditions, you're not going to get it. Well, God gives us the power to be wealthy as part of his covenant. Look at Deuteronomy 8.18. You shall remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you power to get wealth, that he may establish his covenant, which he swore to your fathers, as it is to this day. And that covenant, which we know means cut in blood, is like a contract. So this analogy with your aunt leaving your money is actually a pretty good one. In that same uh, chapter of Deuteronomy, the Lord is making it clear that it's not by your own hand, but from God that we can be wealthy. Now we have to be good stewards, as we're gonna talk about, and that results in the fulfillment of his promises because he knows that we are then able to handle wealth. Let's look at, the, at Psalm 112, uh, 1 to 3. And I don't know whether I put some of this in, I didn't in it, italics, but listen to this psalm. Praise the Lord. Blessed is the man, what? Who fears the Lord, who delights greatly in his commandments. Those are two conditions. As we continue, his descendants will be mighty on earth. The generation of the upright will be blessed. Wealth and riches will be in his house and his righteousness endures forever. So clearly the Lord wants us to prosper and the conditions re reveal what I'll call the very first principle, which is fear the Lord and delight in his commandments. 
that is the mo one of the most important principles that we have to keep in mind if we are interested in abundance. Can we put, do we put the first principle up, Reyes, or not? Not sure. There it is. So that's a call for obedience. And not just the word, but listening to the Holy Spirit, we have to get our house in order if we seek prosperity. So we want to we wanna obey the word. We want to listen to the Holy Spirit. And this is principle number one for a reason. Proverbs 3, 1 and 2 in the Amplified says, My son, do not forget my teaching, but let your heart keep my commandments for the length of days and years of life worth living and tranquility and prosperity, the wholeness of life's blessings, they will add to you. You know, this drives me a little bit crazy when I hear people say, well, you know, and I heard this last week, I'm just a sinner saved by grace. No. The Holy Spirit empowers us to resist the devil and he will flee. Yes, from salvation perspective, of course it's important to know we're forgiven. But by God's grace, we can get our house in order. And with the Holy Spirit, this is why grace can be defined as God's enabling power. So don't be content and, uh, and dance around the sin thing. It's going to block you from abundance. So if we follow, Psalm 84, 11 says, if we follow his laws, that will apply. So the Lord God is a sun and shield. He will give grace and glory, and no good thing will he up withhold from those who walk uprightly. Again, this refers back to this first principle. We don't just follow his commandments, though. We delight in them. Are we getting to the point where we can actually delight in following his commandments? This is a key to prosperity too. We are so enamored with what he says that we actually delight in our obedience of it. And by the way, there are lots of examples in scripture of wealthy people. Joseph of Arimathea, Solomon, even Adam had everything he needed until he forfeited what he was given. How about Jesus? We're going to talk about Jesus. A lot of people have a conception that Jesus was poor. We're going to, I want to tear, tear that one down. That's a sacred cow that I think needs to be uh, focused on a little bit. So, 2 Corinthians 8, 9. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that you through his poverty might become rich. Now it says Jesus was wealthy there, and became poor for our sakes, through his poverty may we, we become rich. Now, is this really about finances? So a lot of people think, oh, no, no, this is about Jesus making himself spiritually poor. Really? One of the first lessons in studying scripture is you got to look at what's going on around the scripture you're talking about. It's probably, I'm going to say it's probably both spiritually, but it's definitely financially, too. Because chapters 8 and 9, so 8 is where you find that verse, and the next chapter, that's all about finances. The, that's the context. Chapter 8 is about giving to the church, and chapter 9 is about giving to the poor. So we are talking about Jesus' finances. So with the death and the burial and resurrection of Jesus Christ, a lot of things have happened that affect finances. One, we regain dominion over the earth. Two, we know by the stripes of Jesus Christ we are healed. Three, we received and are empowered by the Holy Spirit to receive the gifts of the Spirit, including performing miracles just as Jesus did or even greater than he did. Uh, and then as it says in Corinthians 2, 8 and 9, our wealth and prosperity can also be restored. So you see on the cross, there's a whole restoration that applies to us. And it's not just healing. It's our finances as well. We need to recognize that. And we need to even declare it. Now, was Jesus poor? Well, the verse says he became poor. He even gave up his clothing. And by the way, the Roman soldiers that, that, that took lots... That was a one-piece tunic, and if you do a little re research into that seamless one-piece tunic, it was actually quite valuable. Uh, they weren't just doing it to make fun of him. They were doing other things to make fun of our Lord, but there was value in that tunic. So as a carpenter, he may have been poor. I'm not saying that, but during his ministry, the evidence is different. Twelve disciples plus 70, they were all provided for. 
His, his ministry even had a treasurer. That was unusual in those days. Now, he maybe could have made a better choice for treasurer, but I'm not going to argue that. Supernaturally, Jesus fed 5,000 with loaves and basketfuls left over. And don't forget this. Jesus paid the tax collectors for himself and Peter in Matthew 17, 27 from a coin and a fish that Peter caught. So... I think we can say that he was able to meet the needs of himself and those who were following him. Now, I don't think many of Jesus, I, I do think, that, and this was just occurred to me uh, actually this morning as I was looking at some of these, my notes, that many of the miracles involved actions by other people. He could have paid the temple tax out of the treasury box but Peter found it in a fish, as instructed. And I'm sure he didn't want the disciples to think he could have just created money out of air. But in, same with the catch. The disciples caught them when Jesus told them to cast their nets one more time. He could have had the fish jump in the boat. But no, they, they had to do something. Jesus supernaturally provided a donkey for them to ride into Jerusalem. Uh, he was able to have the upper room uh, so that they could celebrate the Last Supper and the Passover. And th the disciples were involved in each of those miracles. In fact, the spiritual gifts that we have today, we are involved. When we do healing, what does it say? We lay hands. There's action and, and, and we co-labor with Christ. So this co-laboring is important in finance. It doesn't mean that we just sit on our behinds and wait for money to fall in our laps. We want to look at these principles and we want to be listening to the Holy Spirit as we move forward in our financial lives to listen to where it is that the Lord is directing us. It's not going to fall in your lap. And there are smart things that you want to be doing, which we're going to cover mostly in the third session. Uh, but I just wanted people to see that this is consistent with really so many different aspects uh, of our lives. Our co-laboring our participation. Second principle. We have not because we ask not. So you know this one. Jesus relied on the Father. He followed God's laws of prosperity. Relying on the Father is certainly one of them. Uh, look at John 14, 13 and 14. And I will do whatever you ask in my name so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. You may ask me for anything in my name and I will do it. So, this principle, again, doesn't automatically mean you're going to get everything you ask, right? You need to be following other principles, especially the first one we had. Uh, and again, as I said before, it may not be in your best interest to get it if you're a poor steward or for other reasons. Or you may not get it at the time you're expecting it. So we're going to cover next week seed time and harvest and what that really means. But often it means patience. And also, let's not forget the condition in that, in that verse, in his name, means there is an alignment between our will and God's will. Now, the good news is, as we go through life and as our souls conform to Christ, there is more and more of an alignment, and it becomes more natural that we begin to ask things in God's will. But ask yourself, what, where are you? What is going on in your situation? So we can enjoy prosperity but only if we employ the same principle that Jesus did. He sought God's will for his provision, asking him first, so we should be doing that. He went through the word to understand the promises that God already provides, the conditions that he asks for, and finally, we have to have the right heart. What is the motivation for our ask? I cannot stress that enough. But the principle does hold, we do need to ask. Third principle, putting God first. So I talked a little bit about the prosperity movement. When we want the $2,000 sports car, are we putting God's first? I mean, there's nothing wrong with a sports car, but unless we're putting it, and if we're putting it and other things ahead of God, we have a problem. And this actually brings us to a scripture which I could argue is, is actually the main theme of today's talk. Matthew 6, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. I love this verse because of the prioritization. It's right in front of you. So are we putting him first? 
Are we starting our day in prayer? Are we studying the word? Are we meditating on it? Do I put God ahead of each member of my family? Am I putting God ahead of my, ahead of my hobbies? Uh, ahead of the things, ahead of money as we talked about? How about my job? It's really interesting when we talk about our jobs. Because we can put our jobs ahead of God, but it need not necessarily be the case. And I do want to talk about that. Um, okay, well, let's talk about it. <laughs> we can put our work before God, but not when your work is part of your calling. Then you're really not putting ahead of God. You're actually being quite consistent with what he wants, and you are considering the Lord in your everyday workplace. Working can actually be part of putting him first. Don't think that if you're working full time, that means you, you must be making work your idol. You could be, but God wants you to make a living. And you have to think about what your attitude at work is. Are you looking for divine appointments in your workplace? Look at that sphere around you. How's God working with your relationships of the people that you work with? Now, some people really wonder whether they can actually be called to a profession. A lot of people think, all right, if you're gonna be called, it's gonna be part of the fivefold. I'm called to be an apostle or a prophet or a teacher. One of those things, but a vocation? Does that make sense? Well, there's lots of biblical examples where it happens, but my favorite one, of course, is David. So when Samuel approached Jesse's house and we met, met his first son, Eliab, he thought this was surely, you know, God's anointed choice. But we read in 1 Samuel 16, 7, the Lord said to Samuel, Don't, do not consider his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. The Lord does not look at the things people look at. People look at the outward appearance, and the Lord looks at what's in the heart. Now, there were six other brothers. By the way, interesting, I just realized that's the seventh choice. Hmm, God's number. Uh, there were six older brothers that seemed better suited. But Samuel wanted the runt of the litter, the guy who was outside watching the sheep. That was David. And so he was called. He was the youngest, but he was called. And that was not a ministry position. He was called into what? Political leadership, right? So we can be called by God into our very professions. Um, but also important here is that God called David. Uh, and, and because he called David, it, it really, and, and the same thing for us if we're called in our provisions, it really does allow us for all of that time that we are in those professions to be putting God first. That's the main thing. By the way, the Hebrew language supports a lot of this concept. If you look at the Hebrew word for ministry, the Hebrew word is sharat, and it literally means service. It's the word that's used to describe when the priests were uh, in the tabernacle and all the work that they were doing, that was considered sharat, and, not, and, and all of them, including the Levites, and even the Cohens that had specific job of cleaning the tools, those were all considered sharat. Anything we do in service to others is considered sharat. And so, yes, our jobs can be considered sharat. But there's even a better word, a, more, a little more general word called avad. And that means in service of the king or work or work the ground. Again, a link between work and service. And guess what? It also means worship. So there's literally and actually a link, and this is true in Jewish culture, between work, service, and worship. So I promise you, if you're thinking about your jobs that way, you're not putting your job in front of God. So back to the third principle of putting God first. I do want to note uh, Psalm 22.4. It says, by humility and fear of the Lord are riches and honor and life. So when we put God first, we also want to treat him with respect by humility and by fear. And here's another word uh, investigation. The word fear in Hebrew is yara. And listen to this. I've never heard of fear of the Lord this way, but I really like it. It's giving the Lord your undivided attention. Like think of Psalm 86. Giving God unrivaled awe and unparalleled allegiance as in like Deuteronomy 10. And so I'm going to read that again. So fear of the Lord, yara, give the Lord your undivided attention, giving God unrivaled awe and unparalleled allegiance. What is that? 
That's putting God first. Principle four. You hear this a lot at King of Kings, and I love it. We need to pray into the promises. We pray a little bit too much sometimes, if it be your will. When we understand his will already from Scripture, we can declare it when we read it. All these prosperity scriptures I'm giving you, you can begin to declare them. You have dominion. You're the blood bought sons and daughters of the Most High. Pray into it and declare the abundance that God already has for you. (sighs) Instead of being problem-centered, we got to be God-centered in everything that we do. So focus is on, on his promises, not your problems. That means, of course, we got to know the word to find out what God has already promised. And hopefully this talk will help you see some of the promises. Principle five, understanding that God owns everything. Now, in the interest of time, I'm just going to rattle through some verses real quick. First Timothy 6, 7, for we bought nothing into this world. It is certain we can carry nothing out. Deuteronomy 10, 14. Indeed, heaven and the highest heavens belong to the Lord your God and also the earth that is in it. Haggai 2, 8. The silver is mine, the gold is mine, says the Lord of hosts. And Deuteronomy 8, 18. You shall remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you power to get wealth, that he may establish his covenant, which he swore to your fathers as he did this day. By the way, this verse, 8, 18, makes it clear that it's not, it's not only our possessions Not ours, but in fact, God has provided us with everything that we have. And this is really important for us to understand. Get away from thinking that you are the only reason for your success. The Lord gives you certain skills, no question about it. But God is not just the author of our salvation. He is the author of our prosperity. I need a t-shirt, somebody. (laughs) Principle six. Be careful not to be proud of whatever wealth you have. Be satisfied that you've worked hard, that you co-labored properly with the Lord. But don't get proud. Jeremiah 9, 23 to 24 in the nearly inspired, I mean the NIV. Let not the wise boast of their wisdom or the strong boast of their strength or the rich boast of their riches, but let the one who boasts boast about this, that they have the understanding to know me, that I am the Lord who exercises kindness, justice, righteousness on earth, for in these I delight, declares the Lord. So if we want to boast, boast that we know the Lord. What This is all, all about shifting from self over to God. Even when you prosper. It's true before you prosper. It's even more true afterwards. Or else, what's going to happen? You're not going to keep it. Without this and other principles, it's harder. Yes, it's harder for a wealthy man to enter the kingdom of of heaven. So I do have to show you Mark 10, 25. Everyone's heard this. It's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. This, this verse has really troubled a lot of people. Well, I guess I can never end up with any kind of wealth. Look at this verse. But we got to understand the culture, okay? The gates of cities in those days had what a small door called a night gate. Why we would call it a night gate, but which was typically called the eye of the needle. So one at a time... A person could get through the eye of the needle at night when they came into the city. Not hordes, not soldiers, one at a time. Provided that the camel would, one, be unloaded of all its earthly goods, and two, get on its knees to get through the gate. Now read that again. Okay? So what do we have? It's not that you can't be wealthy, but you have to be willing to unload your possessions if asked. You have to not put those possessions first, and you have to get on your knees. So it's not impossible, but there are requirements. And so these principles are supposed to help us understand that. So principle seven, I've already alluded to this a couple times, so it's about time I talk about it. Being a good steward of what we have. Why would our Father give us unwisely? Do we budget? By the way, we're going to talk about budgeting in the third session. Do we tithe? We're going to hit tithing next session and a a lot about it. There's misconceptions about tithing. I'm going to hit those. We will get into that. 
but I promise we're also going to get really specific about how to be responsible with our finances in that third session. And there's going to be some tough messages for people in that session, but there is a way out. So math 20, Matthew 25, 20 and 21. So he who received five talents came and brought five other talents, saying, Lord, you delivered me five talents. Look, I have gained five more talents besides. The Lord said to him, well done, good and faithful servant. You were faithful over a few things, and I'm going to make you a ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. So what does this passage show us? The importance of being a good steward of what we're given. We shouldn't be putting our money under a mattress. We should be investing our money wisely, scripturally, consistent with kingdom. By the way, kingdom investments are some of the best. Right? Putting your money in things that are advancing the kingdom, giving to your church and, and other causes, those are great investments from a kingdom perspective, and I promise you they will return. However, there are also other things that we can be doing. I'll, I'll tell you what we shouldn't be doing. We better avoid some of those get-rich-quick schemes. The Bible warns against that. I'll get to that uh, in Proverbs 28. So we have to be really careful that we don't do it our way. Again, relying on self. Oh, I heard of this really good investment idea from so-and-so. It's, it's made this person rich, and it's going to make me rich. No, that's not the Lord's way. We talk about what is his way. It's actually putting a little bit aside at a time, and that's in Scripture as well. We'll talk about more of that. Matthew 19 17 through 22. This is another verse that people struggle with. If you want to enter into life, keep the commandments, he said to him. Which ones? Jesus said, this is the rich young man. Jesus said, you shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness. Honor your father and your mother. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. The young man said to him, all these things I've kept from my youth, what do I still lack? Jesus said, if you want to be perfect, go sell what you have, give to the poor, you will have treasure in heaven, and come follow me. The young man heard that. He went away sorrowful. He had great possessions. What is the lesson there? Does it mean if you have great possessions, you're, out, you're done? No. This is the word of knowledge that Jesus had. He knew the stumbling block in this young man. I know people who have this stumbling block, too. So you cannot view your possessions. First of all, they're not really yours. They're really God's. You're being given stewardship over possessions. And if you are totally focused on that one thing, you got a problem. It's the same principles we've been talking about. In this particular case, that was this young man's issue. It could be anything else. Now, what blocks us from receiving wealth? Well, the world believes it all be well if they can just have some money. It's not true. Uh, we cannot be content. If we can't be content without wealth, we're not going to be content with it. Ecclesiastes 5.10 says, He who loves money will not be satisfied with money, nor he who loves abundance with its gain. This, too, is vanity. Sorrow comes from the love of money, as we talked about in 1 uh, Timothy chapter 6. And Psalm 10.3 says, coveting what others have also blocks us from receiving wealth. So when we hate covetousness, we prolong our days. That says that in Proverbs. So let's be careful of these get-rich-quick schemes. Um, I know I've got a friend of mine who actually is a minister, and he's completely obsessed with Bitcoin. Uh, and the other thing he's doing now is trading silver futures. I'm like, what are you doing? There's a lot about some of these investments that people are acting out of fear. I promise you, if it's acting out of fear, it's not from the Lord. So we need to be really careful about what I call the fear trade. Um, it's dangerous because it's not godly. Okay. Principle eight. We must rely on God, not ourselves or other institutions or schemes for wealth. Now this is important. We talked a little bit, uh, danced around this a little bit, but it's not just that we're relying on God, it's that we are being very careful about other things that are not of God that we're relying on. 
Are we putting our money in institutions that may or may not survive? Right? I, I was advising somebody very recently who had all their money in their company stock and they thought it was a great idea. You're, you're putting your whole wealth in one institution. So complete self-sufficiency means we are turning from God and to ourselves. We should not be self-sufficient unless it's through our obedience and reliance on God, not ourselves. So there's an element of self-sufficiency, but it's really because we are turning it over to God. It's really not us. It's really him. Principle nine. I'm running low, so I'm going to get through ten this week. Principle nine, don't over-accumulate or hoard. Accumulation of riches can block us. Ecclesiastes 5, 12 to 13. The sleep of a laboring man is sweet, whether he eats little or much, but the abundance of the rich will not permit him to sleep. There is a severe evil which I have seen under the sun. Riches kept for their owner to his hurt. This doesn't mean we shouldn't plan. It doesn't, because look, look at Joseph. He obviously planned. He, did, he was a little bit of a prepper, right? But he was told by the Lord to put provisions together for seven years. Looking at Proverbs 21.20, precious treasure and oil are in a wise man's dwelling, but a foolish man devours it. So what am I, what am I saying? There's nothing wrong with property, with investments, with bank accounts. But if we only rely on them and we have so much financial cushion, we're no longer relying on the Lord. So what we have to do with, with our finances, we have to plan. We have to take a reasonable path. You should save for retirement. You absolutely should. But there are people out there that are saving millions of dollars and holding on to it with a fist. That's not right. You want a reasonable plan. You're still going to depend on God for the ultimate outcome. You're going to be smart and take provision, but you're not going to, uh, you're not going to make it all on your own self-reliance. Hoarding, by the way, is fearful, is, is another uh, expression of fear. It's a preoccupation with ourselves. It's evidence of this, what I call a sin of self-sufficiency. 1 Timothy 16, 6, 17, and 18. Command those who are rich in this present age not to be haughty, not to trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God who gives us richly all things to enjoy. Let them do good. Let them be rich in good works, ready to give, willing to share. Okay? So I want to just reiterate that when you hear about gold and other things like that. That's part of this sort of fear trade. Okay. You're cutting me off. Oh, I have a little more time. All right, we'll hit a few more of these. Okay. All right. Principle 10, plan for future generations. Now, you, you see there's a little bit, it's this, this is not so black and white. On the one hand, we want to plan for the future. On the other hand, we don't want to be all about self-sufficiency. All this means is that you're bringing the Lord into everything that you're doing. Your planning process needs to be a co-laboring, right? You need to be consulting with the Lord on how you're planning. Principle 10, plan for future generations. We want to leave an inheritance. Proverbs 13, 22, a good man leaves an inheritance to his children's children, but the wealth of the sinner is stored up for the righteous. This takes careful stewardship and wise planning. I'm going to hit principle 11. Take care of others, especially the poor. Failure to help others is a problem. And by the way, this is the one place where you can even lend to your brother. So Deuteronomy 15 talks about this. Uh, normally, and we'll talk about this later, right? The borrower is slave to the lender. I don't want people with lots of debt. However, there is a permitted form of debt in Scripture, and it's in Deuteronomy 15. At the end of every seven years, you shall grant a release of debts. And this is the form of the release. Every creditor who has lent anything to his neighbor shall release it, and he shall not require it of his neighbor or his brother, because it is the, called the Lord's release. So this is one place where the lending is okay. 
to family, to believers. But note, this is the Jubilee system. Every seven years, these debts are canceled. So I would submit to you, these are not really lending. This is more of a gift, right? Because that's going to be canceled. There is forgiveness. So I think we need to think about those as gifts and not so much as lending. And there's a lot of scripture about helping the poor. Proverbs 28, 27 Whoever gives to the poor will not want, but he who hides his eyes may get a, will get many a curse. Galatians 2.10, only they asked us to remember the poor, but the very thing I was eager to do. Proverbs 14.21, whoever despises his neighbor is a sinner, but blessed is he who is generous to the poor. So, I, you know, I believe you can do this directly or indirectly through institutions we like to give to. This is one of the things about King of Kings with our food pantry and other things that we do. Um, but doing that doesn't absolve us of our kingdom responsibilities, right? So there is an important principle that we will hit next week on sowing wisely. We're going to talk about reaping, sowing and reaping. We're going to talk about seed time and harvest. And we're going to talk about planting a wise seed. There's just so much here where I have to spread it out over three sessions. Okay, principle 12. Watch for a spirit of poverty. You may need deliverance here. I want to talk about this one. This is not one you're going to hear a lot about, but it's important. Proverbs 6, 9, 11. Read this carefully. How long will you slumber, O sluggard? When will you rise from your sleep? A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to sleep. So shall your poverty come on you like a prowler and your need like an armed man. Okay. This is talking about a spirit of poverty, right? If you read this carefully, coming on like an armed man, coming like a, like a prowler. So if you're in agreement, this poverty spirit can, can actually claim you and can actually affect generations. So look at the different things that are in there. Laziness, just a little, a little sleep, a little slender, a slumber. The word sleep in Hebrew, by the way, is shaha, and it refers to growing old without vision. It's really a mindset. And also this, a little slumber can be drowsiness or even depression. Right, so we're starting to see the, the poverty spirit, the signs of it, people that are in depression, the people that are, are they, they don't have a vision, they're kind of a little bit lazy now, they don't see any hope in the future. Those are sort of evidences of things that there may be a poverty sp uh, spirit involved. Uh, the folding of the hands, that's a Hebrew word, chabag, and it means idleness. So poverty, I think, in this verse isn't a condition. It's an armed man, a prowler, a spirit. The prowler is walking to and fro looking for entry, searching. What is he searching for? A legal right to enter. The armed man is magan. In Hebrew, it means shield. Why? That's interesting. The enemy in its efforts to devour is actually protected because the right we give it to legal access so we need to make sure that we break that. So if we're taken by an armed man, take some comfort in Luke 11, 21. With a strong man fully armed, guards his own palace, his goods are in peace. But when a stronger than he comes upon him and overtakes him, he takes from him all his armor in which he is trusted and divides his spoils. So let's, we can reverse laziness. Let's, let's be open to correction and instruction to break the enemy's legal right, to reverse addictive behavior. Uh, Proverbs 23, 21 says, for the drunkard and the glutton will come to poverty and drowsiness will clothe the man with rags. So if that relates to a bloodline or a lineage, you gotta break it. Do you see a lot of poverty in your own family history? That's a clue. You may have to repent for yourself and your ancestors. Do you have thoughts? Like, well, you know, I, I'm, I'm poor, my whole family is. That's just the way it is. You need to break that. Remember the promises we talked about the first, most of the beginning of this. Claim the prosperity that Jesus has given you on the cross. Break that generational curse. Contact the deliverance ministry if this sounds like your situation. Every one of us needs a checkup from the neck up, okay? 
So they can, this is beautiful thing about King of Kings. You can really break this if this is what's going on in your past. Is that a good advertisement? Yeah. Immorality is another way to grant the poverty spirit a right of access, by the way. Proverbs 6.26, for by means of a harlot, a man is reduced to a crust of bread. Adulteress will prey upon his precious life. So we have to think about that, generational issues. And there are other parts of this we're going to get into the giving, as I said. But let's just say that a lack of giving can also be evidence of a poverty spirit and can allow the enemy entry. If you're absolutely kind of refusing in that area. And also, you know what? Habitual sin can be an entry point, too. So really, don't hesitate to get help if you're struggling. A lot of this can be broken. All right, principle 13. This really will be the last one. And then we'll save the rest. Uh, actually, you know what? I'm going to stop here because it's 8.10. And I also want to give time for people with questions. So why don't we stop here? I'll do th continue with 13 next week. Any reactions, concerns? Wow. <laughs> wow is good. So the handouts do have a list of all the principles, and you'll, you'll see a sneak preview of next week as well. Did anybody notice that I really didn't talk that much about finance? The key is not really so much about finance. It's the Lord. It's where we are in every other aspect of our lives that's going to have the biggest impact on where you are in your financial life. Well, I guess that's it. Thank you. What's that? Hold on, Tim. Oh, put the principles back up. Yes, yeah, we'll hit 13 next week, the importance and practice of renewing our minds. That's so, where we're going to start next week. So I have a question. You have a question? Yeah. yeah. Well, maybe just for you to talk a little bit more into it. Uh, you mentioned for 12, the whole... Sorry? For, so for 12, the, the poverty spirit. Uh, could you talk a little bit about more how, like, that mindset? Because you mentioned mindset in this... Right, right. So there's obviously could it be a generational thing, right? Is it is it just a spiritual thing that we could inherit, or uh, I think this is a big one. Right? It's yes, so, but but there's mindsets that yes. that are attached to this. So there's I mentioned a couple of the mindsets associated with a poverty spirit, but um, if you find yourself having resentment of people who have wealth, okay, that can be a pervasive. That can be part of that as well. So that there are, there are lots of indications. And, and also, it, it, it almost extends to a level of not making sense and making it almost impossible for you to believe or to do the things that you need to do to get out of it. You focus on it like it's the most important thing. Like You can't get over the fact that your neighbor has sins and has all of this stuff, and I don't. And you can't let go of it. That's not logical, right? That's not how we're taught to behave as Christians. So you're sort of reaching a level of illogic because it's become part of a mindset that you have. And it keeps you from getting ahead. And the enemy loves that. The enemy wants you to think, well, who's, this, who's this Jesus Christ? Why, why, are you, why am I so poor? He's supposed to promise abundance. So you really get into a mindset and you have to break it. So we just finished Eliza House, and I was wondering if even the, t the, t the teaching of bitter root judgments and expectancies could be tied right into yeah, this. Yeah, bitter root judgments. Thing. It is. Right. It's, a, it's a good point. Yeah. Yeah, in the Deborah. back. Oh, come up here. Come up front. Yeah. Okay, so I was just wondering if you could expound a little bit on when you were talking about being self-sufficient and how does that differ or does it differ from being financially independent? Yeah, so the question, you heard it, self-sufficient and being financially independent. So 
this is tricky, and you heard me stumble a little bit with it, right? Because we want to depend on God, but it is, a, it is fine to be financially self-sufficient. We want to be. So I think the answer to how you actually get to that point in a godly way is including the Lord in your financial plans. That is the key, right? So if you're, if you're listening to the Holy Spirit, he's probably not going to tell you to put all your money in Bitcoin, Okay? Having a Christian financial planner who, who know, knows their stuff may be a way to help with that, with some of that. But that's the key. There's nothing wrong with reaching a point of financial independence. We all want that. It's how are we getting there. And the other thing is we've got to be, we gotta smart, be smart about it. There is no wealthy person that I'm aware of that got wealthy by borrowing on their credit card and using their points for frequent flyer miles. There's literally no wealthy person that I know that used frequent flyer miles to get wealthy, okay? <laughs> so we want to understand the godly way of, of moving ahead. Anything else? Okay. Oh. There's a scripture in uh, Psalm 78 that says, how often they rebelled against him in the wilderness and grieved him in the desert. They constantly tested God and provoked the Holy One of Israel, for they did not remember his power shown on the day he redeemed them from the foe and uh, when he performed his miraculous signs in Egypt. And it goes on. When you read through Psalm 78, God was so offended by the people because they did not believe him. And that's the whole thing, too, with the poverty mindset. It's a scarcity mentality in that not knowing that God wants to provide, but we have to abide by the concepts in the Bible about tithing and giving. And, you know, to our natural mind, it doesn't make sense. But, but God has a plan. He has a financial. He's, he's the financial strategist, right? And he's the one that gives us the, the guidelines to earn money and to get us out of debt and to supernaturally provide for us. So it's really important you know, that we understand that. And, and like what Ron was saying, like all these principles are absolutely right on because seek ye first the kingdom of God so that all these things shall be added unto us. And I know we know that, but when things get tough is when people can get panicked and say, all right, well, but do we believe him or not? And money is a heart issue. And so it's, God wants us to prosper. Psalm 35 says that, beloved, I wish above all that my servants prosper. And, and that, so, you know, we have to ask ourselves, Lord, am I having a problem in sowing and giving? You know, um, do I want to? What does the word say about it? See, the Bible says, if you love me, you obey my commands. And you can give 15 reasons why you can't. And God says, they're not good enough for me. Give something. But learn, and then, then keep on. And, and it, again, it's it just, I've seen God... Like, break me. I, listen, I know poverty mindset. I was the, the poster child for that. That scarcity, that limitation constantly. And even to this day, you know, the Lord will deal with me about having a limited, like limiting him. He says, stop limiting me. And, and so we have to, you know, just repent for, for limiting him. And so, you know, my husband, we were, uh, my husband ministered to someone, and uh, he was just really... You know, you know, robbing Peter to pay Paul, you know. And so my husband said to him, listen, it's going to take you time. And Ron would know this because Ron does this, you know, financially as a business. And he said, it's going to take you time. He says, but, but you know, you, you have to get rid of your credit card debt. You have to get rid of this and that. And it took him two years, and he got out of debt. And, he, and I'm telling you, he wasn't, it, it was, it God just supernaturally provided for this guy. And it was the first time he was in his early 60s, was able to purchase a home. And, you know, but God made a way. So it's a discipline. And so, you know, just, just I want to encourage everyone. That's why we really wanted Ron to teach this because the things, the area that, that really the enemy hinders uh, is finances. And, and it says the wealth of the wicked is laid up for the just. And there are over 2,000 scriptures in the Bible containing, uh, pertaining to finances. So you think God had a lot to say about it? 
Listen, God, wa God was wealthy, and he is wealthy, <laughs> not was. And, and he had, a, like Ron said, he had a treasurer. And he wants us to prosper, and he wants to come out of that stinking thinking, or, you know, listen, we're in New Jersey here, the BS, the belief system, <laughs> the belief system that we believe that God, that we're never going to get ahead. We've always been in this stinking place where, you know, this is our problem. Listen, God's saying, do it my way. And it's not going to happen overnight. It's not the get rich scheme, although that would be awesome. But, you know, it's God trying to teach us the disciplines of the word of God. So I just want to encourage you. And Ron, everything Ron has here is just awesome because it's, it's our relationship with God. So, Ron, that was awesome. So I don't know if you want to close in prayer. Question. Another question. What came to mind was Acts 20 where it says it's better to give than to receive. Yeah. So when we think about investing, oftentimes from a financial perspective, is to invest in order to get a gain. Yeah. But th if you could speak to the, what comes first, is it's investment meaning to give and how that returns onto us. If you want yeah. to just, I know you touched on it. But I, I touched a on it a little bit, and we're going to do, actually next week, quite a bit on giving. But what, what we're going to talk about, I'll give you a preview of what we're going to talk about. There's actually a whole cycle of giving that started when God created the earth. That, was, that Bereshit, in the beginning, is actually the root word of the giving process that God started. And there's honor and love and respect that he has for us as he gives to us and that we return in return. That cycle of giving is much more than about money and prosperity. It's actually an entire cycle of honor and love. And that means Dick isn't going to come next week. I know it. <laughs> no, it's really cool. So we are going to talk about giving, but maybe in a way you haven't considered it before, because it is much more than getting something. It's a whole way to show God how much we love him, because he has loved us and honored us first. Does that sound familiar? It's really cool. Yeah. So thank you for bringing that up. And by the way, I don't want to, a little preview for, for part three but some of you who are in the sort of car loan trap, because, hey, you need a car, so you got to have a car loan. And this goes on for decades. We keep doing it. But if we can just wait and buy a clunker, do you know how much money you can save over your lifetime? I'm going to show you. That's for the third week. Pray us out, Ron. Pray. Ron, pray. <laughs> Let me pray us out. So, Father God, we just thank you. We thank you that you're so smart. You've given us everything in your word that we need for finances. Who knew? You did. So, Father, we thank you. We thank you for the wisdom that you are giving us today. We anxiously look forward to uh, what you have for us in the next few weeks, Lord. Help us to implement in our lives these principles that you have before us so that prosperity, as you have promised, can be ours. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.